Okay, I wanna introduce Alan Wyndham to the uh, monthly meeting of the Master Gardeners of Hamilton County. The Master Gardeners here have been going, on, going for over 25 years. I think this is the 26th year that the Master Gardener program has been in place. I've been here 16 years. And before that time, just before that time for seven years, I was in the, uh, the plant diagnostic uh, lab, the plant, they changed the name to the soil plant and pest lab. And at that time, I met a man named Alan Wyndham. I guess he was probably the first one I met. And uh, it became a, he's become a lifelong friend, I, I should say, since then. Um, I've learned so much from this, from this man and he's shared his knowledge with probably every county agent in, in the state of Tennessee and beyond you know he's he's known nationally he attends a lot of the regional and national meetings he's sort of a turf expert you might say it's one of his specialties but he's a well-rounded individual he's actually one of uh he's a twin his twin brother is also a phd and and uh, at the usda and he has another brother who's um a uh, full professor at UT, so imagine three brothers in the same family growing up on an extension kind of a farm, and they all became PhDs in some form or fashion in plants. So um, I'm going to welcome Alan Wyndham to our to our meeting, and and everyone will be just um, just um, enthralled by what he's going to talk about. Even though it's plant diseases, he knows how to how to show some really great pictures. So Alan, take it away. Thank you, Tom. Tom, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. Yes, yes, I can. Okay, great. So welcome, um, calling in from Nashville. You know, I, I've done a lot of, this is the fourth Zoom meeting this week. Uh, it's only the second one where I've actually been a speaker, but it's actually kind of growing on me a little bit. Two weeks ago, on a Thursday night, I spoke to Master Gardeners in Lauderdale County and that was a smaller group, but it was a good group. So I was doing some reading this week, and I was reading an article about George Washington Carver, <clears throat> which made me want to read more about him. But one of the interesting things about George Washington Carver was, especially later in his career, he was really interested in plant diseases and fungi. And what I found, some information I found out in the article that I didn't know was that he had actually collected fungi in my home county in Mississippi, in Kapai County. And those specimens are still preserved in the National Fungus Collection. Probably didn't know there was a National Fungus Collection, but there is. There is a National Fungus Collection and George Washington Carver's uh, specimens are still preserved there and they're still used for taxonomic work by people around the world. So I found that was really interesting. So right there in my home county, he had collected in the 1930s. So that was, that was good to find out. Uh, some things you may not know, but I bet most of you know, and that's one of the things Extension does really well is publish good information, unbiased information. And I'm just amazed at the number of publications that come out every year and are available on the UT Extension website. And you probably all know this. You may not be aware that my older brother and I published some new publications last year. This one on boxwood blight. Uh, interesting enough, Tom, I haven't seen boxwood blight this year. Yeah, I haven't either. You, you've not either, okay. Uh, another publication last year, and this is one we're really proud of, is one on rose diseases, and it's eight pages long and has over 50 color illustrations. These are all illustrations that I think, except for maybe one or two of the might uh, images, these are all images that we've taken uh, through the years, most of them in Tennessee. But it, it turned out really well. We're really proud of it. And then for you know, for master gardeners, and I'm sure you're asked a lot by neighbors and friends and people you run into, you know, what's wrong with my plant? We wrote this one last year, six pages long, over 50 illustrations, diagnosis of ornamental plant diseases. So I'll help you go to the UT Extension website, publications, 
you can search by plant disease or search by rose or boxwood, whatever, and find these and look at them. I hope that they'll be useful to you. Suzanne mentioned our Facebook page. Uh, boy, we've kept this running. You know, the interesting thing during all this, I've been back at work full time for 10 weeks because we don't have a diagnostician right now, so I've been covering for that position, and that's kept me kept me busy. But the soil lab's been open the, this this whole time. I think they I don't think their numbers drop that much. Uh, they're still running soil uh, soil tests over there on the other side of the building, and forge testing things like that. But if you haven't followed us on Facebook, hope that you will. Uh, we're closing in on 9,000 followers. Maybe we'll reach 10,000 this year. Uh, it's been, it's, it's the feedback we get from this when we ask questions is really good. And we learn a lot from each other. So follow us on at the Soil Plant Pest Center on Facebook if you haven't. And just the kind of post that we put up <clears throat> on June 3rd, I diagnosed downy mildew on basil here from a commercial grower in Williamson County. And that's the earliest that I can ever remember seeing downy mildew on basil. And then a few days later it was diagnosed, or it was found, yes, in a nursery by Les Southern, it's one of the plant inspectors with the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. So it's definitely out there. Um, Dr. Hell often puts up really good posts about, you know, what's going on in the insect world such as this uh, two-line spittle bug damage that you saw on red buds uh, last year. You may be used to seeing two-line spittle bugs on turf, but they will go to certain plants and feed and cause damage. So all of our posts are well illustrated and hopefully helpful. So what are some of the plant diseases in the news today? Uh, citrus greening, I saw a little video on Twitter today, some avocado avocado trees being pushed over in, a, in a Florida due to laurel wilt. And that's a disease new to Tennessee last year. We found a, the photo there are sassafras trees that were killed by laurel wilt. It's a, a vascular wilt spread by a little ambrosia beetle. And uh, there's a cluster of counties right here around Nashville where it was found last year. Nowhere near Hamilton County yet, so that's good. I had a question for someone yesterday about sudden oak death. They were worried about their oaks uh, being infected. And what I told them is I don't know of any oaks that have been infected with sudden oak death in Tennessee or really the Eastern US. We do occasionally get nursery stock, say rhododendron, azalea, camellia, uh, a, a foliar blight caused by the fungus that causes sudden oak death. But as far as oaks, uh, we haven't seen that. And let's see, I'm going to go on. Let's get to. Oh, <laughs> Tom, have you heard of the Tom Brown virus? No, I haven't. Okay, so the Tom Van Brown virus is short for tomato brown fruit rugose virus. So you can see why it's called Tom Brown. And it was found in the UK, it was been in over in Europe and other places, and uh, it was found in the UK last year. So it's seed borne, it's a tomato virus, seed borne. I know the University of Florida lab, they ran about 4,000 samples, tomato samples before Christmas. Uh, they did not find it, uh, thank goodness. But there's just always something new. One thing to look for is, this was on Twitter yesterday, this uh, Ed Sikora with Auburn University posted this image of uh, downy mildew on cucumber. And it can be really devastating to cucurbits. Now it's been, I think it's been identified in Alabama, North Carolina, probably South Carolina. I don't know of any reports. If you do see this, it's gonna be probably angular yellow spots like this on cucumbers, squash, pumpkins. Uh, if you see it, Dr. Hansen, Dr. Zach Hansen, who is our fruit and vegetable pathologist, would really like to know about this, Tom. So if you hear anything about downy mildew on cucurbits, let Zach okay. know. 
So that was just yesterday. Uh, today, on our distance diagnostics page, <clears throat> where the agents send in things, this is from Wilson County, and I think this is tomato spotted wilt virus symptoms on a tomato. What do you think, Tom? Certainly could be. Is it scattered? It's probably scattered, right? It's usually scattered. It's usually, you know, you'll have maybe 12 plants and maybe two will have kind of wilted. But we look for these purple lesions on the stems, on the petioles, and sometimes you'll get there were and sometimes you'll get this weird kind of symptom along the veins. So this is a thrips transmitted virus. Uh, it's not something that comes in and wipes out all your tomatoes, but usually it's, it's hit and miss. I mean, if you lost 50% in a garden from this, that would be rare, but just watch, watch out for this. Uh, it may show up. So that was from Wilson County today. The other thing that I was asked about today was bacterial leaf spot on oak leaf hydrangea. This is a very common disease on oak leaf hydrangea and not particularly damaging. It's more of an aesthetic thing, but I'll just say this, when you're shopping for plants, be aware of leaf spots on plants because in the case of bacterial leaf spot on oak leaf hydrangea, if you take home a plant with this, you're probably going to have it for the life of that plant. It's not going to go away and there's not some easy treatment for this. So, let's see what else. So what I'm doing is I'm starting like today and then I'm backing up through time things that people have sent, have sent me or have looked at. So this was, uh, this was yesterday. Someone here in town had bought a slender silhouette sweet gum last year and they planted it and they were worried. They, these are the symptoms on the foliage. So they were very worried about it. They asked the garden center about it and the garden center sent them here. So the sample comes in, the foliage comes in and the person said, well, I'm gonna send you some photos. I'm like, great. So I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, okay, well, it looks like a possibly a fungal leaf spot with some leaf scorch, but you'd rather not have it, but it's not that bad. But then the photos came in. And when the photos came in, <clears throat> the, there was a photo of the stem. And what I would call this is a catastrophic, this is catastrophic damage to the stem of that tree. Now what caused it? I don't know. We did have a freeze here in November when we went, we went from 64, after all the heat in the fall, we were at 64 degrees, November 11th. By November 12th, we were at 17 degrees. So some of this, and then the last place, where's the last place on a woody plant to go dormant? that lower stem. So if we have a freeze in the fall, late fall, in a sudden drop in temperature, you can have cambium tissue killed here. So unfortunately, I told the owner, I said, this is, you know, I would consider this catastrophic damage. I would replace the tree because the, the, the plant, when it's split like that and you've got that much dieback, there's just no way for that tree to form callus tissue and heal that wound and what? So what's gonna happen now is you're gonna have wood decay fungi get in there and they're going to destroy the wood that's supporting the weight of that tree. Uh, but you know, as bad, as, as bad of news as that was, the tree is less than a year old, not that large and shouldn't be, shouldn't be too hard to replace it. And raise your hand if you've ever had to replace a plant. I have, okay, so I've had some trees that I just love dearly that bit the dust. And so it happens. And that's, you know, anybody that grows plants, it happens to You'd rather it didn't happen, but it does. So we've had lots of questions about this. This may be something you've seen, cedar quince rust on the fruit of hawthorn, service berry, crab apple, ornamental pear is pictured here. And not yesterday, I got a, a uh, picture of this from West Tennessee. They wanted to know what was coming out of the fruiting pear. Well, this is, you know, this is one of the cedar rust. And right now, the spores that are being produced in the fruit. And actually, I got, today, I got a picture of a, an ornamental pear that had spores like this coming out of the stem. So that can happen, too, on some of the pears. But 
these spores being produced here on this fruit are blowing back to the cedar and infecting the cedar needles. They are not infecting the pear. So if you had a fruiting pear and you wanted to protect it, you would have to protect it during bloom or right after bloom when the cedar rusts are active and they're coming off of the eastern red cedar or junipers. So right now there's not much to do except, uh, well there's actually nothing to do except plan for what you're going to do next year. I will say this, during this tenure where I've been doing the diagnostician position and I've talked to a lot of people about fruit trees, it, uh, and when I'm usually talking about diseases, very few people are following any kind of regimented spray program for fruit. Now we do have, if you go to the UT Extension webpage, we have a very nice home fruit spray schedule and that Dr. Boss put together with some help from Dr. Hale uh, before Dr. Boss retired a few years ago. But yeah, we've got a lot, we've seen a lot of this. So just the cedar rust, they're really kind of, they're really interesting. They're really interesting fungi because they have, well, this is cedar apple rust and we start in the spring with this, these orange horns coming out of the galls on the cedar trees. And inside of those galls are teleospores right here. And do those blow and infect the apples? No, it's not that easy. Those germinate, we go down here to the lower right, here's your teleospore, it's germinated to form two structures called basidia. And they produce these little spores and these little spores are called basidia spores. Those are the spores that blow and infect leaves on your apple. And then there's another spore stage produced on the upper surface of the leaf here. And the fungus grows through the apple leaf, produces a fourth spore stage that blows back to the cedars at this time of year and infects the needles. And in two years, you'll have a gall that produces this in the spring. So Alan, I have a question Okay. from the crowd. Beverly Fowler asks, what does the what do those spore, what does that do to the cedar tree? You know, the cedars tolerate the cedar rust very well with very little damage. Now you will find, sometimes when you're hiking in the woods in the spring, you'll find some mature cedar trees that have cedar quench rust and they'll just have this huge mass of spores coming out of them. But I've never really seen, I've never really seen a cedar rust that damages a juniper or cedar. It's just or the eastern red cedar. I will say this, some of the ornamental junipers that we grow will get cedar quench rust and occasionally you will see some dieback of needles on those on ornamental junipers. I, I'm thinking of Taylor juniper over at Cheekwood that was not looking very good and the last couple of years I've looked at it and it's just they're massively infected with cedar quench rust. So on occasion the orn ornamental junipers may see some damage but generally not. So somebody asked, so basically somebody said, so an, an apple orchard would not want cedars nearby. That would be true, and that's difficult. You know, in, in Tennessee, that's very difficult to get away from cedars. Uh, I will say this though, people that have really severe damage from cedar apple rust or cedar quench usually have junipers or cedars within a few hundred feet, or say sometimes within 50 feet, or sometimes across the driveway from their apple trees or pear trees. So the closer the two hosts are together, the more severe the damage. So it's like most of the commercial orchards all have a spray schedule they'll follow to prevent infection. And there are other things that we can do. Uh, there's a lot of resistance. So if you wanted to pick some apples that were resistant to cedar apple rust, you could. So on June 3rd, so this has been about two weeks ago, diagnosed had a commercial grower that produces herbs for the restaurant and some stores here in Nashville brought in basil that was infected with downy mildew. And you can see kind of this sooty looking growth on the other side of the leaf. The other thing I look for on basil when I'm looking for downy mildew is this kind of sectoring where you have a yellow sector limited by the veins, and then you have a green sector limited by the veins, and then another yellow sector. 
So when you see that, that's a that's often a sign of downy mildew, but often if you see this and you flip the leaf over, you'll see the sporulation on the underside of the leaf. So this is a close-up of the sporulation, looks kind of sooty on the underside of the leaf, and this is a shot that I took of that sporulation a couple of weeks ago where the fungus uh, produces these spores that are blown and, and are infective and will infect more basal. And like I said, Les Southerns with Tennessee Department of Ag found this on some basal, and I don't know which county, I haven't found that out, but somewhere in East Tennessee, uh, the same week that I found this. So it's around, and it's early. Some years I don't see this until August. All right, so what's the good news on basal downy mildew? There, there are, you know, if you've had a problem with this, and I was kind of surprised the commercial grower wasn't doing this, but uh, there is resistance. So there's Amazel, there's Prospera, there's some uh, basal cultivars, Obsession and Devotion, released by Rutgers University. So you can see the one in the center there that's just covered with downy mildew, and these two that were in the same trial are, look pretty good. So if you've had a problem with downy mildew, there is resistance available, so that's a that's good to know. Is anybody growing gardening patients in their gardens? I know I am, and our, my wife and I have a townhome now, and we have a little nano garden, but we do have garden patients. So uh, two companies in 2019 released garden patients that are resistant to impatience downy mildew, which is a totally different organism than the one that attacks basil. And it's the Imera series of impatience from Syngenta seed in the Beacon series. Has anybody seen these in the Chattanooga area for sale? I know that there are some garden centers here in Nashville that sell these. But this, you know, we first found this, I had somebody to walk in from the Green Hills area of Nashville in 2012 with downy mildew and garden impatience. And that, from that time on, the percent of sales of garden patients has dropped and dropped and dropped because of this disease. So it's hoping that they rebound. Garden patients and petunias were the number one and two bedding plant for 20 years in America until this disease hit. So if you've had a problem with downy mildew and garden patients, look for the Beacon series or the Imera series of garden patients. I grew some of the Beacon series last year, and they did well. And uh, a colleague I know, Dr. Alan Owens, retired now from LSU. He had these at the Hammond Research Station in Louisiana, and they just did terrific. So one thing that we're seeing this year, Katie Kilburn, the state plant pathologist, she'll send me over things that she's seen. And she has had several samples of Hostavirus X uh, they're collected by plant inspectors this year. I guess I'm guessing from different garden centers, but the easiest symptom to detect hosta virus X on hosta is this abnormal greening along the major veins. This is a hosta called Paul's Glory. And <clears throat> this hosta on the right, I'm not sure the name, it's from my garden. Uh, I do keep a few hostas that have hosta virus X to use in workshops and when I have students here to show them virus symptoms. One thing you'll notice on this hosta on the right is that there's some rugosity or kind of wrinkling of the leaf. Sometimes we associate that with hosta virus X, but not always. There are times where you see this curling, wrinkling of the leaf and we can't detect the virus. So that in itself is not a problem. So one, one thing that I say about the the hosta virus is, is if you're going shopping for a, a particular cultivar, know what it should look like. If it doesn't look like it should, there's a chance that it may be infected with hosta virus X or some of the other viruses that infect hosta like tobacco rattle virus, uh, tomato spotted wilt virus, uh, things like that. But just know after, you know, for several years, we had a student that worked on this virus for several years and I collected samples for her all over the state. And at the time it was pretty easy. This is probably 10 years ago, pretty easy to find. And then there was a period where 
everybody seemed to be cleaning up their act and it was harder to find, but it's kind of creeping back into the trade. So look for that. Uh, this, these are photos that I took, oh, a couple Saturdays ago on crab apple. Um, most crab up, this is apple scab, most crab apple cultivars that are on the market right now are resistant to this. So that's good. I'm not sure how this, this isn't a commercial landscape. I'm not sure how the landscaper was unlucky, unfortunate enough to have this because what it does is the trees shed a lot of leaves at this time of year. So they don't look very good. And the fruit can be scabby and infected too. So this is definitely a disease that you can manage by, if you're buying a crab apple, buy one that's resistant. I know in, when we lived in Murfreesboro, I had a prairie fire crab apple that we enjoyed for 20 years. And it was resistant to cedar apple rust, powdery mildew, scab, frog eye leaf spot, and fire blight. So resistance certainly is out there. And then one thing, being the acting diagnostician this year, one of the things that we've just been swamped with is just samples from con of conifers, cypress, cryptomeria. I think I've looked at more Hinoki cypress this year than I have in my whole life. Um, Arborvitae is not a frequent flyer, especially not green giant, but we've looked at quite a few green giant. And I think most of this goes back to the, the drought that we had in August through early October in 2019. Here in Nashville, we went 39 days with only two one hundredths with uh, the inch of rain. And during that time, we had 27 days of 90 degrees or above. And we even had September 30th, we hit 98 degrees here. So really challenging for conifers that weren't irrigated. So this is January of 2020. Took a shot in Franklin, Tennessee of ceridium canker on Leyland Cypress, which is just not a good plant for most of us to plant. And then I was back in the area this, oh, a week or so ago, and I took this shot. So the canker damage had really advanced, and it's really not, what I, I told somebody today, I was asked about the specific disease today by someone in Putnam County. And I said, you know what? Probably not the plant I would choose, but if you do have it, you've got to be proactive and you have to water during a drought because you can't be reactive and react to it once it happens, it's too late. So we're seeing cryptomeria. And I, I would say on most, most of the things that we're seeing, we're not picking up mites, insect diseases, we're calling most of it abiotic from either the late freezes that we had here or the drought that we had in 2000, 2019. Now, when you're talking to people, it's funny how many people even forget we had a drought in 2019. For instance, I was talking to my brother in Starville, Mississippi, and I was telling him about all the damage we were seeing from the drought. He was like, well, I don't think it was, he said, I don't think it was that dry here. So I looked it up and Essentially, they had the same pattern we had, but he had already forgotten. So after a few rains, people forget about the drought, but the conifers don't. And sometimes it's months after the stress that you'll start to see ceridium canker, which is a fungal canker, or botrysphere canker, which is a fungal canker. Or even if there are, say, azaleas that are damaged by a late freeze in November when we drop from 64 to 17 degrees and the, and the bark is busted off the stem, it may be next, the next spring once it gets warm before the azaleas show any damage from that. So there definitely there is a lag time between the injury or the initial stress and when symptoms show up. This is from Putnam County today. This is... Uh, Pretty typical when you have ceridium or botrysphere canker on Leyland Cypress. One of the things I tell people to do if they're trying to diagnose it, I'll say pull the foliage back and look at the main stem and see if you see any weeping. And the, most of the time where you see the weeping is where the canker is and the canker can be extensive. So if, you know, if someone's sending us a sample and they want a confirmation, what I want is a section of a branch or a section of the trunk where the weeping is, and that's generally where you find the fungus. 
And like I said, there's no treatment for this after the fact. It's all preventative, proactive watering to prevent the initial drought stress. Oh, you know, it's one thing that's very interesting, <clears throat> not having done the diagnostician job for a long time is, especially if all the conifers, someone, what do you think they, what do you think they bring in when they have a dead conifer? Do they bring in a root system? No, they don't. They bring in, they bring in a little piece of dead branch. And if the canker is not there on the dead branch, there's not much that you can say other than it's dead, but occasionally you'll get an overachiever that brings in the whole plant where you get to look at the root system, you get to look at the main stem, all the foliage. So this was a Hanoki cypress that after looking at probably a dozen of these, someone brought in a whole plant. And so I washed out the root ball. And what I found was that the roots were 99% dead. So if the roots are 99% dead, is there a little wonder that most of the needles are dead. No. So one of the things that I did was we've got these, uh, for root rot, we've got these little kits, these immunostrip kits for Phytophthora, and I checked the roots for that, and it was negative for Phytophthora. So this could, again, be abiotic. This could be, you know, we had a lot of rain uh, during the winter, January, February, mild and wet. So this dieback may just have been from poor drainage, excess water, maybe the roots just drowned, but whatever, whatever happens to the roots, the foliage is going to follow. But this is, this is a great sample. I get excited when I see a sample like this because I get to look at the whole plant and it's rare. Well, do you remember the cool wet spring that we had? It seems like a distant memory now, but it was, it was really ideal for anthracnose diseases, including anthracnose on sycamore. And so often with our diseases of trees, genetics play a role. Now this is out at Edwin Warner Park here in Nashville. Uh, and this sycamore, if it's cool and wet, it gets anthracnose every year. But to my back, about 100 feet away is a sycamore that gets a little bit, but doesn't really seem to show much effect. So genetics do play a huge role in, in the amount of damage that you'll see on a tree from a disease like anthracnose. Now, generally what happens to this tree is that as it gets warmer and drier, this tree often will refoliate. And by midsummer, you'll never know that it had anthracnose. So that's good. This was an interesting sample. This was from a, these are trees that were grown in Franklin County at a nursery and they were shipped to a, they were shipped to a retailer in Virginia and the, the retailer in Virginia, and this was, I think they were shipped maybe over a year ago, but the retailer was seeing this damage and he sent samples to us to look at. Uh, one thing that's just amazing, when I washed out these plants, and the whole plants were here, so that was great. When I washed out these, these were like the healthiest roots I had ever seen on a dogwood. When I had gotten an email that this was coming, I was kind of thinking, okay, I'm going to see discolored roots. They're not going to look good, and that's why the trees aren't doing well. But no, actually, the roots were fantastic. So one of the things that's really fortunate for us being together with the soil lab is that I was able to take media over to the side of the building for a container media test or container substrate test where they looked at nutrients. And what they found like on the top two there that are showing the intervenal chlorosis, almost zero nutrition in the media. So the person that had these trees had not fertilized the trees. I mean at all. And when you, you know, there's, there's really no buffering capacity in pine bark. So if you're growing plants in pine bark, you have to maintain nutrition. Otherwise you wind up, there was like zero nitrates, maybe one part per million of ammonium. And even nutrients that usually aren't low, like phosphorus were very low. So I think the main problem was nutrition. It wasn't a disease. Well, I, as I said earlier, I haven't seen boxwood blight, but we were getting a lot of boxwood samples in early and they all look like this. They were 
and some dead foliage. This is uh, the new growth was just starting. A lot of last year's foliage was turning brown. A lot of concern. And what we were finding was, and you can see it even in this, there's this little, this pink fungus called Vayutella is sporulating all over these leaves. And when we look at it closer, we can see this fungus here on the leaf. So what we also see was damage from, you can see where boxwood leaf miner had exited. So most of the samples we were getting that looked like this, they had pretty severe boxwood leaf miner infestation last year. The leaf miners had damaged the leaf, exited, and then Volutella was growing on those damaged leaves. So our main take home lesson here was prevent boxwood leaf miner and you probably won't see as much of this fungus Volutella. So this has been a big topic too. This is, uh, I don't know if you've seen this. Tom, have you seen any Craig Myrtle's damage? Not from scale. I'm here not I mean, from, this, these are from, I think, from the freezes, the spring. I didn't see too much, no. So this is interesting. I, I posted about Craig Myrtle not growing well a few weeks ago, and over 7,000 people interacted with that post, and it, it, was, it went to like 40,000 Facebook pages. And it really kind of hit a nerve because we heard from people from Memphis to the Tri-Cities talking about how their crepe myrtles weren't leaping out like they thought they should. Now, both of the crepe myrtles pictured here are Natchez, white blooming, tree form, tough plant. Normally don't see anything and these are not, these don't have the bark scale. But we think this is all winter injury. So you may have seen it. Uh, Carol Reese wrote a news release about this that came out through uh, the Institute of Ag a few weeks ago when she talked about this damage and some of the options. And I've even talked to some of my neighbors in the townhomes about what to do with their crepe myrtles. These cases here are pretty extreme. Uh, in a lot of cases in the last couple of weeks, these have come on and have grown out some, but some have not. So your options are either to, I told my neighbor, this is what I told my neighbor, I said, go high because you've got growth that's coming on. So cut the dead branches above the growth or go low and that's just coppice the plant, just cut it off at the ground. Because in her case, she had a lot of shoots coming up and I said, you can let those grow this year. Next year, choose five to seven, print away all the rest and let those grow. And you'll probably see them grow five to six feet in one year. So every couple of years, we'll see damage like this from winter injury on crepe myrtle. If you like to grow herbs, this might interest you. The probably the number one disease of lavender is Phytophthora root and crown rot. This is a sample from Murray County, Columbia, Tennessee, from someone who was test growing some lavender with the idea of ordering hundreds more and growing lavender commercially. But the big problem right now is Phytophthora root rot. And so a few things that I told her, number one is you've got to find a vendor that's really savvy about Phytophthora root rot and it's using best management practices to make sure that they get you healthy plants. And number two, I told her, I said, you know, the Extension Service has a Center for Profitable Agriculture that will help you with a business model and help you with marketing uh, your business. And she didn't know anything that we even had anything like that. So that was good information. So this is not an easy thing to deal with, uh, but it is a big problem with lavender. A lot of people are looking for value added things that they can do, but you have to be smart about it. Otherwise you're gonna, you're gonna lose money. And there's not, there's not really a curative treatment for this. It's all about the grower growing healthy plants, you're getting healthy grants, or plants, growing them on a uh, soil that's well-drained and hoping for the best. Uh, occasionally, we will get questions about mushrooms. I think last week, Tom, you probably have gotten these. Someone told me that their dog ate uh, some mushrooms and got sick and how could they how could they control mushrooms? Uh, normally what I would just say is, okay, so they're 
ephemeral. They're not here very long. You can just mow them down. Uh, if you see these mushrooms, this photo I took in my neighborhood where I think where a tree was taken down. So basically what I tell people are this, as long as there's a food source, which means there's wood under the ground for these mushrooms to grow on, they're gonna pop back up from time to time whenever conditions are right. Usually it's gotta be wet. Uh, this is an inky cap mushroom, but uh, only in certain instances. I mean, there are fungicides that are labeled for fairy ring, but it would be a really expensive proposition for a homeowner to use a fungicide to try to manage of mushrooms in a lawn. I would probably just take a rake and knock them down or mow them off and let them dry up. <clears throat> Occasionally we'll get questions about slime molds. This is the dog vomit slime mold. Fuligo septica, this is on a tree here at Ellington Center. It was about, this was kind of unusual because usually you see these down on the soil or just, you know, on plants very near the soil surface. This was about seven or eight feet up a large oak tree here on the center. And it's harmless, uh, but it was very interesting to see it one morning when I got to work. And let's talk about, did you have any damage on May 3rd from the straight line winds that came through? Many people, many of our master gardeners had damage from the tornado that the Easter evening tornado that came through in April. Okay. All right. I don't know what happened in May, but that was our, that was our big um, event. So our big event here was the May 3rd straight line winds when we had 70 mile an hour winds come through and trees that were compromised by root rot or decay uh, we lost a lot of those. So it's, you know, it's been five weeks since we had that damage. And there's a business that will take your yard waste and they grind it up and make mulch out of it. And I, from time to time, I've gone to drop things off there. Last week I went by there. I could not believe, this is like a five acre pad that they allow you to put things on and then have a big front end loader that drops it in the tub grinder. The mountain of plant debris from this storm that's still being collected. The, these large trucks were wrapped around the block to go through and unload. And the mountain of debris was like three stories high and three to four acres wide, it was unbelievable. So one of the things is that this was a tree that fell here at our office. Tom probably remembers the white pines that we mm -hmm. still have a good many, but not as many as when he was here. So one of the things that I went out and looked to try to determine why this, this white pine fell, uh, one of the things that I saw was this fungus growing on it. This is a fungus called, uh, used, used to, we would call it a gnosis root rot. And uh, this fungus will rot the roots so that they're brittle and a uh, little wind and they won't hold the weight. So I put a photo of this up on Twitter and this forest pathologist I know in Minnesota said, well, there's also another fungus there and another shot I had put up, he saw uh, some root-like growths of a fungus called armillaria. So that's two fungi that were attacking this tree. And then I have found a third fungus that damages the roots. So, you know, one of the, one of the things that's really difficult to diagnose, even for a professional arborist to diagnose, is damage to roots. Uh, because you don't see them. You know, they could have this fungus growing on it, be really compromised, so it wouldn't take much to blow them over, but we just don't know it until it happens because it's so difficult to diagnose problems that are underground like this. And the other thing right now, I think I took this photo a couple weeks ago. This is one of the carbon crust fungi, Crestmeria dusta, and it's really common. It is a pathogen. Uh, I saw this on a mature hackberry, but in just a few days, we had some images from uh, pig nut hickory, on maple. Uh, this fungus will attack all kinds of trees. And, you know, it's compromising this tree and destroying the wood within the trunk. Can destroy the roots. Uh, this, this is one of those things that you 
This grayish growth here is the newer growth. What's black here is the older growth of the fungus. This is one of those things that you just hope you don't see on a favorite tree because there's not a treatment for this. Generally, when someone contacts me about this, if someone asks you about this, probably a consult from an ISA certified arborist would be good or a consulting arborist would be good just to let them look at it and maybe estimate how much damage. And basically, the tree species and the fungus combination, they probably have experience to know how damaging this is going to be. Uh, we Yesterday, I got I was answering some uh, local <clears throat> person here in the neighborhood brought by some tree specimens and they had lichens on it. Now it wasn't these, these I took down South Carolina uh, in May. And this is a Christmas lichen, which is really colorful lichen. That's really beautiful. But people often think that because a tree is declining and they see lichen growth, they think the lichen's damaging the tree or killed the tree and it did. It's not a plant parasite. But sometimes people are not too receptive to hear that. But lichens will grow on fence posts and rocks and even vehicles if they're left in one place long enough. This is a, as far as the leaf spot diseases, this is a, uh, been a frequent flyer this spring. This is the fungal leaf spot on Indian hawthorn. And often people want to know I've got the symptoms here, the leaf spots, purple borders. This is the fungus fruiting bodies in the spots, and these are the spores that the fungus produces. People often want some, well, what can I spray? Well, you're gonna have this disease forever with this plant, so short term, could you spray? Yeah, you can spray with a fungicide and protect foliage that's healthy, but long term, it's not too attractive because you'd have to do that every year and you'd have to do a spray multiple times each year, so. There are resistant cultivars of Indian hawthorn. So if you're thinking about planting Indian hawthorn or recommending them, do a little research and buy a cultivar that's resistant to this leaf spot, or this will dog that plant till the day you dig it up, throw it on the burn pile. One of the things that I tell Master Gardener interns is that most galls that we see on the leaves of plants are caused by mites or insects, but there are some fungal galls. This was a, my twin brother sent me these probably a month or more ago. This is uh, Exobacidium leaf gall on Sasanqua familia. And you see all the fleshy leaves there. You know, interesting, this fungus will sit on the leaf buds and not cause any damage and infects the leaf. The, as the leaf starts to expand, it will infect it, cause this leafy growth. You could just prune these out. Not something you probably have to spray for, but we also see uh, there's a, Fungal leaf gall like this on blueberry. Uh, there's one fairly common on deciduous azalea. And then a lot of our semi evergreen azaleas will see um, fungal leaf galls on. And, and also um, the Camellia japonica, the big leaf Camellia, we'll see it on it too. But generally not very damaging. And then what else? <clears throat> Early spring, I saw downy mildew on rose. A lot of our retail garden centers just walking through and looking and saw that uh, the roses for sale were infected with downy mildew. And there was pretty good sporulation, like the basil that I showed you was producing spores. The downy mildews, you know, they generally sporulate on the underside of the leaf. And on rose, you generally will not see this with the naked eye. All you'll see is the, the angular lesions. And that the lesions look slightly different depending on which cultivar that they're on. So, but where do we see the most damage? We see the most damage from downy mildew and rose and retailers that have maybe a garden center that has all their roses in an unheated poly house and the doors are shut and it's cool and moist and it can just explode in a situation like that. Occasionally we do see it in the landscape. This is from the local botanical garden here. This one of their horticultures brought some violas over that didn't look very good. And when I washed out the roots, the roots were dingy. I thought it might be pythium root rot. So I put, stained some roots and put it under the microscope and I saw all these 
uh oh spores, these double-walled spores that pythium produces. Uh, it was later, about a week later, and I think this is, my wife and I were over at Cheekwood before the COVID lockdown went into place and uh, Cheekwood was still open. And this was the bed that he pulled the plant out of. So all the rain that we had in January, February was really tough on plants that are susceptible to root rots. And it's, it's kind of hard to predict when it's gonna happen. And then one more new thing. This was new last year. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about new insects and diseases is that it's probably gonna be someone like you that finds them, not me, because there's just so many people out. This, These were actually two samples of a rust on European and American hornbeam that were brought into the lab last summer. The interesting thing is this rust had never been reported in Tennessee. And when I went online and looked, our records are the records that the USDA keeps, the host index, there was no report of a rust on hornbeam of any type in the US. There was a rust, this European hornbeam, there was a rust reported on it in Europe, but no reports of it in the US. So this is American hornbeam here on the right, European on the left, they both have the same rust. Uh, I have not visited these sites this year to see if the rust is back. But the only report that I could find was uh, one by Jason Smith, who's a professor of forest pathology at the University of Florida. And he's trying to identify this rust. So there's new stuff every year. Every year there's something new. So just be on the lookout. If you see something that looks a little unusual, go ahead and collect the sample. Talk to Tom about it. We're really going to miss Tom when he retires because I don't I don't know if you realize how fortunate Hamilton County has been to have Tom, to have a professional plant pathologist there in your county for all these years. It's so rare to have somebody with that expertise. So uh, I know that we will miss him when he retires. <laughs> hope you made it. Just stay as long as you can, Tom. We need you. I'm trying. <laughs> Assuming we let him retire. <laughs> okay. So that's it. That's kind of a, you've kind of seen what I've seen over the past couple of months. This is uh, Ina, our wonder dog, that she has been able to come up to the office with me some this, this spring when nobody's here. So I can take questions now if anybody has any questions? Yeah, if anybody uh, wants to just um, type in the chat or push your space bar and just talk out loud, that'd be fine. I have a, I have a question in the chat I can start with. Um, Mary Avins, unless Mary wants to ask it herself, but it had to do with downy mildew on native plants. Uh, she saw during a hike on the Cumberland Trail a tree or shrub with leaves doing something similar curling on the edges. So does, does downy mildew yeah. happen on natives? Yeah, it does. I'm trying to think of some off the top of my head, but I think most of the ones that I can think of are not natives. But yeah, downy mildews are widespread. I know that one of our <laughs> colleagues that Tom knows, Marjorie Daltrey, just had a downy mildew named after her. She's really excited about that. But yeah, <laughs> he actually found he found one on Cleome that was that was new to science. So yeah, the uh, downy mildews will hit. They will hit. For instance, okay, so this is a good example. Um, what's another plant species that the downy mildew of rose will hit? Well, brambles. So blackberries, uh, the downy mildew that hits uh, rose will will move to bramble and back and forth, the blackberries. So yeah, there's out there a lot of downy mildews. And they are quite different from powdery mildew. So they're not even closer to related. How do you treat the downy mildew? Do you just cut the affected branches off or take the plant out? 
it depends on the plant. If it's a herbaceous plant, usually the problem with downy mildews is that the spread is just so fast. Often by the time you find that you have a problem, everything's almost destroyed. For instance, the person who brought in downy mildew and guard impatience in 2012, by the time she realized there was anything going on, all of her impatience were infected. And that's pretty common. And I haven't heard the operation that brought the basil in, I bet they dump a lot of their, it's a, hyd a hydroponic operation. I bet they dumped a lot of their basil. On woody plants, you wouldn't have to dump. If you had a rose that had downy mildew, generally they will, as it gets hotter and drier, they'll leaf back out. See, I had that problem with a, a rose that was in a pot and I didn't realize what it was, but the, the under the bottom part there's green coming out of it so my thought is just to cut it way back and see if it'll just come back out sure you can do that um, and by the way this was a really great presentation i enjoyed seeing all this very very good thank yeah, you thank you thank you uh let's see am i unmuted yes um david gardner had a question and i think he has a he wanted to know if there was any update on the hemlock woody algae bug. Oh, I don't know that there's an update. I know that um, we had an extension agent in East Tennessee to send Dr. Hale and I photos of the woolly adelgid on the hemlock. Actually, it was a graduate student from our department. One of their family friends had sent photos. I think. Probably the, probably the most exciting thing about that is that and I think it's USDA Ag Research Service scientists have come up, have uh, crossed with uh, traditional plant breeding, the native hemlock with a Chinese hemlock and the, out, the offspring looks like our native hemlock, but it's resistant to the delgin. So that would, you know, not sure how that would work in forests, but at least in landscapes, that would be great to have a resistant hemlock we could use. So that's probably the newest thing. Okay. Um, question here. How can the fungus that affects the roots of the cedar tree, but doesn't show up in the needles? This is from Carlton. So like the white pine that had the, uh, the gnosis root rot and armillary root rot, um, sometimes you'll see, I mean, it wasn't the healthiest looking tree. The needles were a little off color, maybe a little smaller, but it would really have to advance before you start seeing dieback. So the, most plants that have root rot eventually, you're going to see symptoms on the leaves or needles, but it may take a long time in the case of woody plants. I had a lawyer from MTSU call me once a tree on campus had fallen onto a car of a student. The student wanted the university to pay for the damages. And my response to the lawyer was, this would have been very hard for your maintenance people to detect. But I said, however, I have been on campus and I have seen trees in bad shape that needed to be removed, so. Uh, you don't have a history of removing trees that need to be removed. So there's hard to detect, yes, but you don't have a history of maintaining the trees in the best possible sense. So hopefully they won't call me as an expert witness. The next okay. time I visited campus, two trees that I had in mind were gone. So maybe that helped. 